Good morning and welcome to the 12th round or chapter of the Gentle Rhino series. My name is Ray Wilms. I'm champion of the prayer ministries that occur here, particularly on a Sunday morning across the front. And I want you to know that these people are people who have been trained to do this ministry. It's a confidential situation. So if you uh, might have reservations about coming to the front and praying with somebody after the service, don't, don't let that stop you. They know what they're doing. They're trained. I've always been fascinated with exotic wildlife, and uh, when we stepped into the Gentle Rhino series, I really liked that because I've always liked the mass of African beasts. They've been some of my favorite, along with things like grizzly bears and polar bears and stuff of that nature. Did you know that the rhinoceros is in a league kind of all of its own and that it's tri-toed? He's got three toes, he doesn't have four, doesn't have five. He's got three. So if you're walking through your flower garden this afternoon, you know, the rain and all the mud and everything like that, and you see something that, like, you know, it's been wearing um, like three-leaf clover horseshoes as big as this platform and weighed about 6,000 pounds, it's a rhinoceros track. You walk through your flower garden. So you can look to the person beside you and say, that's weird. And you know that the rhinoceros is related to the horse. He's a distant cousin of the horse. I don't know who figured that out, but they saw the family tree someplace, and they saw that. So if you see Black Beauty running around with, like, a thing on her nose, she's not trying to be a unicorn. She's trying to be a rhinoceros. And see, and that all makes sense. Now you can say to that same person, that's odd too. Rhinoceroses. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, this morning, as we are thinking about the Apostle Paul and his story, and you, Jesus, and your story, may that, those words come to life in our hearts. The power of your story and our story threaded into a cord. Amen. We've been following the Apostle Paul in his travels around the then known world, telling everybody and anybody that will give him the time of day, he wants to tell them about Jesus Christ, that he is the one who came from the Father. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior. He, he gave his life on the cross as a full atonement for our sins. He was buried. He was killed and was buried, and he was resurrected from the dead for us. He tells that story everywhere, it, it, everywhere he goes, and it gets him hero status in some crowds, and it gets him wanted dead or alive status in some circles as well. We could, um, we, we look at the Apostle Paul, and, and we could uh, assume that <clears throat> based on his educational status, that typically when he goes around the country talking or teaching, that um, he would use profound lecture methods. He is, he, today's standards, he's a PhD. Maybe he's a threefold PhD. I don't know. But he was educated by the best of the best. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. So he's right up there on the ladder of the who's who list in the, the realm of scholasticism. But what does he do <clears throat> when he goes around the country? He doesn't lecture profound lectures. He tells a story. Let's see how he describes it to the Corinthian Christians. When I first came to you, dear brothers and sisters, I didn't use lofty words and impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan, for I decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything except Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified, came to you in weakness, timid and trembling. And my message and my preaching were very plain. Rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. I did this so that you would trust not in human wisdom, but in the power of God. That's why he did it. He didn't want people to get caught up in lofty presentations. He's simply going to use his life story. And I'm happy to tell you today that, that there's life. There's life in your Jesus story, where your life story and Jesus intersect. There's life in that story. 
One day after a very challenging talk to his listeners, in fact, it was so challenging that most of the crowd choked um, and they they walked away from Jesus. You can read about it in uh, John chapter 6. And after those people all showed Jesus their backs, he looked at his disciples and he said, well, guys, what do you figure? Are you going to turn tail on me and, and walk away too? You want to go walk with them? And it's Peter, of all things, who says, Master, where, where in the world are we going to go? Only you speak words of love, life. We notice that when you speak, your words change lives and atmospheres. And Jesus, in John 6, verse 30, 63, says, The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Jesus' spoken words become spirit and life. The spoken word morphs into the spirit and life. Not just good oratory. They're alive. Words become spirit. Let's go to Acts chapter 24 and read some of Paul's story. I hope you read Acts chapter 23 and 24, by the way. So Paul's in another tight spot, and he's before the governor, uh, Felix. So he says, the, the governor then motioned for Paul to speak, and Paul said, I know, sir, that you have been a judge of Jewish affairs for many years, so I gladly present my defense before you. You can quickly discover that I arrived in Jerusalem no more than 12 days ago to worship at the temple. My accusers never found me arguing with anyone in the temple, nor stirring up a riot in the synagogue or on the streets of the city. These men cannot prove the things they accuse me of doing. But I admit that I follow the way. Okay, that's the the old term for uh, Christianity, which they call a cult. I worship the God of our ancestors. And I firmly believe the Jewish law and everything written in the prophets. I have the same hope in God that these men have, that he will raise both the righteous and the unrighteous. Because of this, I always try to maintain a clear conscience before God and all people. That's some of his story in that one presentation. Stories offer points of reference and identification. A distant thing that's vague, can suddenly become instantly close and very personal because of a story. Let's see. I want to step out of Acts, per se, for a few minutes, and tell some stories. First-person stories happen around here very often. You're sitting out there, maybe it was your first time at PAC, It was a baptism Sunday, you heard. Somebody was standing down here in the baptismal tank. Their life story was up on the screen behind me. And they're telling how they were just tromping through life or stumbling through life or whatever the case was. Their words suddenly popped into your head and your heart. You weren't paying attention. You were looking at the basketball hoops, wondering, like, well, what's that doing in a church? And then all of a sudden, the person in the tank said something, and, and all of a sudden, you're so focused. It wasn't just a tear-jerking story about how they bumped into Jesus someday in the middle of some stupid stuff. Not that day. On that day, the words that the person in the tank was speaking were coming out of the speaker's mouth, and suddenly they were speaking life and hope to you. They were powerful. You listened. There was something so different about those words. You might have even found yourself weeping out of identification and out of a deep longing to experience what and had experienced. You were saying on the inside, I want that life. I want that hope. I want that peace. I want that for me. I want it, and I want it now. So do you understand and you see what just happened? 
because the subject matter is about the kingdom of God, the words were becoming spirit to you. As they were spoken from the tank, they were becoming spirit and life to you. Personal testimonies do that. The Hebrew word for testimony means verbally and reflectively do it again. Do it again. Tell that story again. Relive it. And as Paul told his life story and of his encounter with Jesus Christ, and as people listened and the story, that life story changed the present, you take a look at chapter 22 where he tells his whole, I got knocked off of a, of a horse one day story. That was in last Sunday's reading. He tells that whole story. This is a PhD. I got knocked off of a horse. Like, don't you have something to say today? So you got knocked off a horse. Your faith story is an invitation to encounter the one it reveals and speaks about himself in your story. How do people find out about Father's Embrace around here? We have another one starting in our home this coming Tuesday evening. How does that work? People, ordinary people like you and I have an encounter with God. And somebody tells somebody else about it and some, something inside of them goes, Pop, I want that. Would you tell me that story again? What? You were at what Ray, Ray and Gloria's and the, the Father's Embrace? And God met you there? And they tell that story. And you listen again and again and you say, I want that. I want that hope. I want that freedom. I want that peace. I want that inner healing. And so this week, again, starting Tuesday evening, we're full because of story and of what God is doing in people's lives. And they're not being short about that story. They're sharing that story. There's a story that's playing out in Acts chapter 19. That's a few Sundays back. A story that started in Luke chapter 8 by a lady sneaking a touch of Jesus' garment. She just snuck in there and touched him and she's healed. And that goes on. Jesus didn't say, that's how to get a miracle. You know, sneak up behind me and just touch the hem of my garment. He never taught that. He never said that to anybody. And all of a sudden, it catches on. And hankies and pieces of clothing are being laid on. The apostles' clothing are being laid on the sick and the demon possessed. And demons are screaming and fleeing. And people are being healed because the story you got around about how that lady just touched Jesus that day and got healed. I was visiting a month or so ago with a friend of mine on our street. He's not here. And we were talking about winter and how it seemed like winter kind of went on long enough. And we're doing what guys in their 60s do. How you feeling? <laughs> Those winter pretty hard on you. Oh, yeah. This and that and the other thing. Yeah, me too, you know. And, and so we get by some of those preliminaries and then he, he says to me, Ray, how are you doing with that cancer thing? Oh boy, I, you got to know I've been praying for this fellow for 20 years. And now he's just saying, serve it up to me, Ray. I'm all yours. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, let's see, how much can you handle today? Uh, hmm. I, I said, um, on the inside, I said, oh gosh. And I started praying. And I said, Lord, I'm just going to walk right into this thing, head down, hand in your hand. Here we go. You give me an opportunity, I'm not backing out now. Hang on for the ride. I said, well, I've been doing really good, thanks. Actually, my oncologist has commented that she and others are pretty much puzzled by my situation. I said to him, you know, and I put my hand on his shoulder because that's, that's, that's just what I like to do and if that freaks people out, whatever, that's just my <laughs> freak out. Um, I said, you know, there's a big part of the story that I've never told you. About six or so years ago, Pastor Nathan took Gloria and I to this church in another part of, the, of Canada. 
because we'd heard that God was doing some neat things there and he wanted to check it out. He wanted us come, to come along and so we went. It was kind of a three or four day thing. I can't remember right now. And right from the start when we arrived at that church, there were some things that just really blessed me like the music-led worship. It was, it was just fantastic. It was almost as good as like here. And the teachings were great and so on. But there was something that was just sort of off-putting to me. People were doing this bending stuff and, you know, twitching. And, and sometimes when people got prayed for, they just like fell over on the floor. I thought, oh, that's like, you can have that. I'll stick with the singing and the praying, like, you know, I don't want to fall on the floor. I think that's, I'm just not into that. That's weird. You can say to the person beside you right now, that's weird. You can say to the person beside you right here this morning, hope that never happens here. <laughs> we'll see about that. You know? okay. So one day, we're there, and there's you know, all these music aerobics going on and stuff like that. And, uh, and people were going up to the front by the drove for prayer. The pastor said, come on to the front. He had this beautiful Australian accent, you know, and undercut chin. Come on to the front. And the people were coming up for prayer all over the place. And I didn't sense the need to go for prayer, nor did Gloria sense the need to go for prayer. So we didn't go for prayer. We went for lunch. <laughs> good for us. They were serving lunch in the church that day. So we went and we had our, our, our good lunch. And then we came back in. And, and the last of the lineup for prayer was just going through. And I said to Gloria, look at that. He's still at the front praying over people. They've been doing that for an hour and 15 minutes. We know what it's like to give and give. And people don't necessarily say thank you. Let's get in that lineup and let's say thank you. She said, I'm with you, Ray. We marched up to the front, got right behind the last guy in the lineup. He went up, he went for prayer. He didn't fall over or whatever. I don't know, he cleared out. We walked up to the speaker, said, hi, Duncan. He says, good day. How can I pray for you? I said, you know what? Actually, we didn't come for prayer. Um, I wanted to say thank you. Really? Yeah. I said, thank you. Um, just thank you for giving, for serving tirelessly. Like you preach for an hour and 15 minutes and then you stand here for an hour and 15 minutes and one by one you pray for 100 or 80 people. That's amazing. We just want to say thank you. Oh, that's so very kind of you, you know. Bless you. Now how can I pray for you? I said, man, you won't let it go. All right, I said, okay. Um, about three years ago I was treated for lymphoma. I went through the whole chemo thing. And uh, remember, I'm telling this to my neighbor in my backyard. And uh, I guess if I would have you pray about anything, I would have you pray that away for me. He just went like that. And he, he looked into my eyes, but he didn't look at my eyes. He looked, in, he looked at this part of my eyes, like right back here. He just looked at me back there. And then he did the most, the silliest thing, like logically the silliest thing in the whole world that's ever happened to me. He pointed at me and he said, I come against generational curses in the name of Jesus Christ. I rebuke them from right now. Yeah! And then he said, and you're going to love this. Pac, you're going to love this. And then he says, Pow! <laughs> oh, oh man, where's this going to end? And then he said it the second time. I come against generational curses and raise life in the name of Jesus Christ. You be gone now. Pow! And then he did it the third time. Okay, I am the first pack guy to go from upside down in 30 seconds, on record. I was standing like this, looking at him. When he did the first pow, I went like this. When he did the second pow, I was like that. And then he did the underhand pow. 
And my right cheek went into that carpet so hard. I know when you're clapping, you're not clapping for me and about me. You're thanking Jesus for what he's alive and he's doing in this world. And it's unexplainable. I did not like where I was. I thought, this is dumb. I didn't ask for this. What are people going to think? Where's Gloria? <laughs> she was okay. She was sitting on the floor right behind me, rubbing my back, just saying, that's okay, Ray. <laughs> just let God work in you. Well, I don't know what's going on. I can't get my head off the carpet. That's okay, Ray. Just don't talk. Just lay there. The Spirit of God's working in you. I kind of uh, reach around, and there's our friends Warren and Debbie Reeve, who were pastors in Kuwait, working with Ken and Melanie Dreger, by the way, sitting right there. And they're all just like, hey, that's okay, Ray. Just lay in there. The Spirit of God's working in you. Okay, I guess that's what you do. Just lay here and let the Spirit of God. Now remember, I'm telling this to my neighbor in my backyard. <clears throat> and I'm looking at him every now and then. T kind of taking the temperature. How are we doing? After about 10 minutes of lying there, just almost unable to get my breath because I was so, so struck in the abdomen. I can finally get my breath, finally get my head off the floor, I'm wiping the drool and, you know, the whole deal off my face. I sit, I get in a chair, and then the four of us went out for, uh, for an evening meal together. <clears throat> Bizarre. And I looked at my neighbor and I said, and so, we've looked back at that experience time and again. And Gloria is such a trooper in the kingdom of God. She kept saying to me, Ray, God did a healing work in your body there. God did a healing work in your body there. God did a healing work in your body there. Ray, I heard you going, I hear you. I was just, <laughs> like, I didn't, uh, is that how he does it? So I said to my friend, there you go. That's the rest of the story. That's my story. He healed me. My oncologist's best guess back in 07 was that I'd be back in two and a half or three years with a full-blown case of lymphoma again. That was nine years ago. Yeah! Nine... Nine years ago. So my neighbor looked at me and, whoop, my neighbor looked at me and, and he said, so, have you told your doctor? No. <laughs> you think I should? Yeah. So I think you should. Might help her with her stuff. <laughs> Perfect quote. Well, I said, all right, I will. Two weeks later, I'm sitting with Gloria in my oncologist's office. In, come, in comes my doctor. After a half hour wait, she was running way, way, way behind. And I said to Gloria, oh, man, I don't have time today. Just don't have time today. She came in, and she was talking to me before she even got into the room. She was coming down the hall, talking, hello, Mr. Wilms, you know, and then came into the door, oh, hi, Mrs. Wilms, you know, and then sat down. And so, you know, looking at your file and everything, and we go through the routine. Probably see you in October, November. Any questions? I said, no, you know, thank you very much. Just love the good care you're giving to me and to us, and thank you. It's, you're, you're a great doctor, and we tried to bless her, and... Uh, I said, I do have a story to tell you. Oh, she said, she gathered my file up, you know, and held it tight to her chest. And I said, okay, it's your story. And I said, but I don't have time. <clears throat> Come on, you've got to tell me your story. No, I said, I don't have time. 
I don't have time today. I'm a storyteller and I need time and you're running half an hour behind and you know, it's just not going to work today. But I do have a story and I do want to tell it to you. She said, all right. She scribbled on my file. Don't you forget. I said, oh, I won't forget. I promise you, I won't forget. She says, um, that's interesting because your file intrigues us. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. My file intrigues them. Have at her. I want to tell you about how Jesus overlapped into my life. Doctor. So a few days later, I'm with my friend again. We sort of picked it up where we had left off a few days before that. We're sitting in the gazebo eating peanuts and chatting about stuff. And I tell them how I had mentioned his name in a devotional that I had done in our school to the grade K to 3 classes. I said, your name came up. He said, really? I said, yeah. You talked about me. I said, yep. What'd you tell them? And then, of course, he had a list of all the stupid stuff, you know. I said, no. I said, well, you know, I was asked to give a talk about the fruit of the Spirit. When the Spirit of God is in our lives, He produces fruit. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, gen- you know, love joy, peace, patience, kind of gentleness. I was supposed to talk about, or I was asked to talk about kindness. And so I needed a story about that for the kids. Oh, now he's interested. So I told him about, about the time I ran my fingers across your table saw while it was running. Oh, yeah, he says, that was a bad one. Yeah, that was bad. Well, he said, I cut my fingers and, and I saw how bad it was, so I grabbed my hand and I ran to your place and I said, hey, will you take me to emerge? I just cut my fingers on your saw. Okay. No questions asked, jump in my truck, away we go, I'm like this, we get to the hospital and there's blood coming down like that, of course, and the nurse says, oh, right in here, in here, and what happened? And I give her the a thumbnail description of what happened, because that's the only nail that was left on that hand. And, and she says, lay down, lay down and hold your hand up in the air, hold, just hold it up, you know, we've got to get the, the pressure down there and slow that bleeding down. I'll look for a doctor. I'm holding my hand up, my neighbor's standing right there beside me. Hold my hand up, hold my, holding my hand up, holding my, hold, holding my hand up. Blood, 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 blood. Finally, I just, I just can't hold my hand up anymore. And, and he said, hey, hey, pal, let me help you with that. And he took my hand and he held it against his chest up here for the bleeding to slow while we waited for the doctor to come to put in the stitches. I said to the kids, That's kindness. That's kindness. Man, he says, I can hardly remember that. Well, I said, I sure do. Yeah, he says, it's all coming back to me now. One more story. Last Sunday, Nathan gave you the permission to do what his kids do when he's telling a story that he's told two or three or four or five times around the table to say, you know, dude, we've been around that mountain before, okay? So you can, some of you, that you've heard this story before and you can say, hey, dude, you know, we've been around that mountain before. Go ahead. Some of you haven't, though. This is for you. A few years ago, Gloria and I were on a motorcycle trip. We were headed west and um, pulled into a service station to gas up and whatever, and just as we were leaving, in came a whole bunch of other motorcycles, maybe a dozen or something like that, and, and um, I, look, I looked at their backs as they were pulling in, and I said to Gloria, holy smokes, did you see the patches those guys were wearing? She said, no, what is it? I said, they're all hell's angels. She said, oh gosh, good. thank goodness they're going east and we're going west. Yeah, I said, me too. <laughs> Wrong. Next little prairie town stop for gas and the washroom break and whatever. Gloria's in waiting for me to top up the tank. She's going to pay the tab. And I hear, and I look and oh my goodness, here they come all, all around me. Just like bees in a beehive. Parking here and there and filling up their tanks and pushing off, going over. Finally, my tank is full. I push off. I go roll my bike off or our bike off to the side, put it on the stand. And I'm trying to engage the guys the whole time. I'm trying to get a conversation going. Hey, you know, a nice bike where you can, you know, how 
nice day and all that, and they all just kind of look at me like, are you stupid or what are you talking to us for? Like, we don't talk about normal stuff like that. Well, I, I don't know. So finally, one of the guys, I was sitting against the bike, and, and I said, hey, you know, my brother's got a, a bike just like that, a street glide. So we started talking about the, the bike, and I see you're from White Rock, B.C., and we chatted about that a little bit, and pretty soon, number three and number four come over, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, pretty soon, twelve, and they're all standing around listening to me have a conversation with this guy about, you know, my brother and his bike and our bike and that bike and the weather and all this kind of thing, and right about then, Gloria's coming out of the service station. <clears throat> Gloria's a Gloria's, Gloria's fantastic. Gloria is a queen. She sees all this going on. I see her coming and I say, Hey guys, I'm a pastor in this little church back in Manitoba at Porters La Prairie. And if you do a photo shoot with us and we show it to the church back home, they won't believe it. Will you do that for us, for my wife and I? Will you do a photo op? And they said, Yeah, sure, of course. Hey man, you know, ho, ho. And so they're all getting around and, and this big guy, Oh, big, B-I-G, this big guy. <laughs> Gloria comes over, and he, and he just goes right up to her. He didn't ask, you know, can I hug your wife? I, I wouldn't have fought him anyway. But <laughs> This big guy, and it's a hot day, okay? Blistering hot day, and he's wearing nothing on top but a black leather vest. And he has got a gut on him that's just way out here. And it's so funny because he's got a tattoo of North and South America across the front of his gut, just like a globe. <laughs> you know? Hey, you kids, you want a history lesson? Here's, you know, the Bay of Fundy and right over here, Vancouver Island. Gosh, it was crazy. He, he just hugged up Gloria real tight and pulled, him, pulled her over and they all come in crowding around us and and, and me in there, and one of them takes our camera, runs over there, and click, click, and they're shooting with their camera. And we say, thank you, you know, and we get to go over to our bike, and we're ready to push off. And, and the first guy that I was talking to, the guy with the nice little mustache and the long hair, he says to Gloria, My father was a Pentecostal pastor. Oh boy! Oh boy! What's going on in that man's heart, eh? What's going on? Why did that man think he needed to say that? What spiritual trauma, um, memories, what, what, what conflict is happening inside that guy's chest? He just has to unload. He just has to say something doesn't matter to her, but he has to say it because, because, because my, my father was a Pentecostal minister. I didn't hear that little exchange. We get on the motorcycle, we ride out, we head west. Gloria says to me, did you hear what he said? And I said, no, and I didn't. Told me his father was a, a Pentecostal pastor. No kidding. I said, Oh, Gloria, I feel so stupid. I, so, I just so dropped the ball. You know, they're going west, we're going west, we all know it. Why didn't I just say to them, Hey, hey, dudes, you know, you're going that way, we're going that way. I know you don't want me to ride with you, and that's cool. You go ride. Could I pray a prayer of protection over you guys and us as we both head off towards BC? Would that be cool? I know they would have said sure. Like, what are they going to do? Kill me in the parking lot at Moose in Saskatchewan? <laughs> I don't think so. <clears throat> so, as we're riding along, I said to Gloria, I will never, ever again pass up an opportunity to pray over an outlaw biker. Never. I did one since then. It was in the airport at Calgary. And I, 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 I bit defeat that day. I'm, I'm ashamed <clears throat> to tell you that. But I've had lots of opportunity since then to go good on that covenant that I made with the Lord that day. I walked up to Hell's Angels by their bikes. As we walked away from our bike, 
and I put my right hand on their left shoulder, and I talk with them about their motorcycle, about the trip, about the day, whatever I can. I engage with them, and in the spirit, man, I'm praying for their heart. I'm saying, Jesus, somewhere in there, there's a little boy. He was just never recognized for who he really was. He's hurting. He needs a daddy so bad. Won't you be his dad? Somehow, someday, will you, will you haul this guy into your kingdom? And of course, I'm always hoping that when I'm praying like that on the inside where it's quiet and I'm talking on the bike, stuffed with my mouth, I hope I never get the two wires crossed. <laughs> Dear Jesus, I mean, no, not you. I mean the bike. <laughs> A story, a testimony. My words spoken are spirit and they are life, Jesus said. Pack, never ever underestimate the power of your God story. It contains life. Whether it's to your doctor or your neighbor or your teammate or your spouse or your child or your employer or your employees. There's a phrase, we read it in chapter 23, it occurs also in chapter 24. Paul says, I have always tried to maintain a clear conscience before God and everybody else. That means, among other things, he never said, gosh, I dropped the ball. I should have told my story. I should have told my story. There's so much joy in our story. Now look to the person beside you and say, I'm going to tell my story. Let's drive it down this morning, guys and gals. Come on, I'm going to tell my story. Make a little covenant here, and then you tell the Lord. You're going to tell people your story. Because there's life in your story. Let's sing together, and then we're going to pray. If you will trust that his presence is upon you when it appears there's no ministry to do. He will trust you with his presence when there is. I invite the prayer team to come to the front. May the Lord bless you and keep you, be gracious to you, give to you his peace, and release to you your recognition of his involvement in your life, your story that contains words of life for people who can't wait to hear it. Have a great afternoon. Come for prayer for whatever reason. You might like prayer this morning. Just come on to the front for prayer. You've been a great church this morning. Thank you. Have a great day.